And now it's time for our next presenter on today's EcoCast. I'm excited to introduce Mr. Roger Levinson, COO at BrainChip. Roger, are you there? I am here. Can you hear me okay? We can. Yes, sir. Thank you for being on. Okay, take it away. Good. All right. I'll take it away. Um, thank you, everybody, and thank you to the previous two presenters for setting this up so well so that I could come in and, and transition us from the software infrastructure that's going to drive AI into the future to the, the hardware that Omri has, has referred to as well, where does this all run on and, and how are we going to get from where we are to where we're trying to go with AI in the future? So here's the challenge at BrainShip that we see every day and that um, all of us are facing. And in fact, we're trying to solve this through software and hardware innovations. But what's happening, um, and we're all facing it, is that the workloads that are being required to provide the AI solutions of the future as they get more and more complex are increasing way faster than the hardware is capable of keeping up. So there's a couple, of, a couple of ways you try and deal with it. Well, let's put more and more hardware. More and more hardware is cost and power. Um, and then after a while, it becomes unmanageable to just support that level of hardware and the infrastructure. So as we go forward, there's going to need to be evolution and revolution in the way that AI is implemented, both on the software side and infrastructure to support it, as well as in the hardware engines that are driving it. Um, but these numbers that you're looking at here, and Moore's Law is the law for semiconductors. It tells you that devices get smaller and smaller and faster and faster. They do that, but they're not nearly keeping up with the need for um, AI, for training or for inference. Um, so the question is, what, what are we going to do about that, both in the data center and then more importantly, as AI extends out to the edge? And that's going to be more of my focus today. So what is... What is the edge? And considering this, this issue with um, needing more and more compute power in order to support the workloads, you know, what's the edge? How's it different from a data center? And what are we going to do in, as, a, as we evolve to solve this problem? So first of all, the edge is even different from data centers where we see the, the challenge from the previous slide that we don't have unlimited power. In fact, at the edge, which is for the sake of this discussion where information is created. This is where sensors exist, such as cameras and microphones. Well, what do you do if you want to make a smart sensor? You're going to have very limited power. It's not going to be hundreds of watts or kilowatts. We're talking milliwatts of power or even microwatts. This is orders of magnitude, reduction in power, but the same requirement in terms of processing information. Um, you need to do training. Omri, um, I kind of mentioned this earlier. What, what do you about, do about training when you want to do training out on the edge? Um, do you need to move send data all the way back to a data center and crunch a deep learning process, or can you do training at the edge? Um, there's going to be constraints on hardware, both from a physical and cost perspective for, me for memory and for com compute in terms of CPU. And then at the edge, you, know, you need to personalize. We want to have unique solutions based on the environment for which a device may be sitting. And you can't always rely on connectivity. Today's solutions at the edge predominantly rely on some level of connectivity, such as Wi-Fi or we're talking about 5G. And this connectivity allows much of the workload to move back to these data centers that suffer from the problem of the compute can't keep up with the workloads. So something's going to shift. And BrainChip has been driving um, architecturally for that shift in the, the form of looking at how our brains work biologically inspired and, and studying neuromorphic computing and have um, basically come up with an architecture that is an event domain processor that's generalized to run many different types of workloads but take advantage of the fundamentals of how the brain processes things in terms of events. This, this leads to ultra low power, the ability to do training and continue to learn once the training is done, which is very different than deep learning. Um, and it's a purpose-built processor. So there's no extra CPU needed. It's very flexible and, um, and minimize the amount of memory needed to try to address all of these issues that you're going to find at the edge when you want to build something like a smart camera or a smart microphone or um, a cybersecurity solution on a small device. So what's the difference between um, what's going on today in terms of data domain processing versus event domain processing? And some of you may have heard of neuromorphic computing, may have heard of spiking neural networks. 
This is the realm of biological research where we understand how the brain works. Based on that, we built a, a hardware platform much more generalized in order to run many different types of neural networks, but use what we know about the brain in terms of event domain processing. Well, my, the best example I like to use is looking for a needle in a haystack. If you're going to use conventional techniques today, or machine learning or AI, basically you're going to do what the guy in the red sweater is doing, and you're going to inspect every piece of straw that's in that bale of hay and to see if it's very carefully to see if it's a needle. That's not what you would do as, as a human. We would go through and scan through all of the straw, noticing that it's uniform, and we would look for something that's different or what we would call an event. So you're scanning through the hay looking for something shiny. That would be an event. Okay, let me spend effort and energy looking at that event and inspect it closely to see if it's a needle. This is the way that we would do it as people, and this is the way an event domain processor does it. It provides tremendous efficiency both in terms of power and speed by ignoring irrelevant information and focusing in on what's really important. So using spiking as a fundamental concept and generalizing that to event-based, what do we get? We get low power by only processing events and ignoring much of the information. Um, by doing this, we're actually able to quantize very heavily. And this is, uh, this is something that goes back to perhaps the, the development infrastructure that data scientists use, where how, you know, how do I know if I need 32-bit floating point in order to have an accurate network or 8-bit integer, or can I do 4 bits? Well, it turns out even at four bits, the um, research is showing, and we've proven that you can get excellent accuracy in the event domain using four bits or less. This reduces your memory, reduces the amount of power, because much less information is having to be moved around for the parameters in a neural network. Um, the processor is built, purpose-built, based on neural processing units that are then arrayed and scaled in order to meet the needs of whatever the requirement is, and these small NPUs are connected together through a mesh network to create what is a larger processor that's properly sized for the application. And finally, the icing on the cake is because it's event domain and BrainChip has developed it's a proprietary learning algorithm based on the way that the brain learns, we could do on-chip learning. You could do learning on-chip and you can do ongoing learning or incremental learning based on a deeply learned network. So I'm going to show you some, uh, a nice example at the end of, of all of this. The um, Akita is our product platform. It's, I mean, just through the technology, at the bottom of the stack is our hardware architecture that implements the event-based processor. Um, we utilize standard, in industry standard tools such as TensorFlow, Keras, and Python. We have a nice environment that data scientists are going to be very um, happy to use to do their developments within. And with that, you can develop standard deep learning neural networks to run on the event domain processor, or you could even do such as convolutional neural networks or even spiking neural networks. We have a wide variety that we can support. And you can develop a fast on-chip learning capability or incremental learning. This whole thing leads to a number of application spaces that it can be used in, which is very broad at the edge, such as vision-based systems or cameras, um, LIDAR data or radar data or other types of sensor data in automotive. Audio data would be smart microphone for keyword spotting or for acoustic analysis or vibrational analysis for health monitoring, cybersecurity. And then uh, I heard time series was asked earlier, certainly, Spiking neural networks are tremendous at, at supporting time series as well as convolutional neural networks. So let me just spend a, a moment intuitively to talk about what's the difference between deep learning and edge training or incremental learning. There's a lot of terms that are used. Um, learning is a continuous process. We experience learning in a deep learning fashion, just like the machines we use today where we go in the classroom, we're effectively taken as people offline in the classroom, uh, loaded up with information, and then we take tests to get feedback, and based on that feedback, we learn more and we refine our learning. And once we're done, we have a certain level of capability or accuracy that we can achieve in assessing input and you know, creating some sort of classified output. However, we do more. When we go out into the world, we continue to learn. And uh, as this boy is showing you, he may have learned about 
um, insects in the class and the features of various types of insects, such as tails and wings and a small head and legs and so forth. Um, however, he may not have seen a dragonfly in the classroom, but he's going to be able to piece this together based on the features he's learned, already learned and classify this as something new and unique. The only thing he's going to need is somebody to label it and tell him that's a dragonfly. Other than that, he's got all the information he needs based on deep learning to add a new class of something to his knowledge base. That's incremental learning. So we support, besides our ultra low power, where we're achieving solutions that take um, watts today, and we're doing it in milliwatts or even microwatts, in addition to that fundamental value proposition for the edge, where we're supporting multiple learning types. And I'd just like to describe basically, you know, a bit of the history and then where it's going. So traditional machine learning is, is shown in the box at the top, and that's the deep learning that, that folks do today large data sets such as ImageNet 1000 and so forth. And you run that through doing tremendous amount of computations using something called backpropagation in order to try and classify those images. And then if it's wrong, feed back some information, adjust the network and tune it until you get the accuracy you're looking for. So that's deep learning. That's a very expensive, time consuming, um, but effective process to train a network. In the lower left-hand corner, you'll see transfer learning. That's where I've done, learn, I've done a deep learning training, and now I'm going to take what I've learned in that network, and I'm going to apply it to a new problem. So maybe I've, I've learned on ImageNet 1000 uh, vision stuff, but now I want to go do something in the audio domain. Perhaps I can take that information that I've tuned my network on and start from there in order to retrain on my audio data and be able to do it much more quickly. So that's transferring what I know from one domain to another and using that as a starting point. It again uses deep learning, back propagation is going to be rather time intensive. And if you want to learn something new, you need to go back through this process. The concept of incremental learning, which is where intelligence really starts to occur, is where you perhaps have done this um, deep learning process and you've created a, a network that learns, but now you want to incrementally add. And Omri uh, mentioned this and alluded to the fact that you know, networks need to be updated. Well, as opposed to going back to the deep learning process, let's, um, let's instead just incrementally add to what we already know. Let's utilize the things we've already learned, just like that boy in the previous picture, and add a new classifier to it. And that can be done in a number of ways. Um, you could do that through back propagation again, although it's rather complex and quite um, involved, um, or you can use feed-forward learning, which is what the Akita platform does from BrainChip, and in that case, we could do something called one-shot learning, where we just take one shot of looking at something and add it as a classifier, assuming that the, the, the network we already have trained is capable of providing all the features uh, about that image, such, in, in this case an image, such that we can classify this new object. And I'll show you some examples here that'll make it easier to, to understand what I'm talking about. Um, today, I'm gonna to show you some examples based on our uh, Makita development environment where we provided a very industry standard set of software tools. So it's based on Python is the environment. We utilize um, TensorFlow and Keras for doing convolutional neural networks. We have our own brain chip environment for doing spiking neural networks. Um, and we have a simulator that simulates our hardware. And just as an aside, our hardware is available both as IP, which is circuit design that can be embedded in someone else's chip, which is called an ASIC or an SOC. But we, we provide that design to go into a processor for a cell phone, for example. And we also are, will be providing a um, chip that will be available in the later half of this year that incorporates everything that I've, I've talked about. Um, let me just show you this the CNN um, development flow where we take a convolutional neural network, which typically does not run on an event domain processor, but we've basically made that um, seamless for folks. We take a standard convolutional neural network, such as MobileNet that I'm going to show you next, a very standard industry standard benchmark, and you can train that, um, do your get to the accuracy you want, do quantization, et cetera, and then we convert it so that it runs on our 
Akita Event Domain Processor, and you get all the benefits of low power and the ability to do continuous learning. So first I'm going to show you a quick video of what does it look like when you're, when you're doing AI? How does that look? So we have MobileNet. We've um, done the, the deep learning training cycles on a GPU in order to get the network that has all its parameters. This is the traditional method. And when you're done, you run a test on it to see how well does it classify the things that you have trained it on. And here we go. So ImageNet, is some of the photos that are based on, that are in the ImageNet database are shown on the left as they flip through and the network is doing its best to classify, you know, how well, what is it that you see. Um, some of these images, they're very detailed, but they can be subtly different than other images. So it can be very difficult to be exactly right on the top one industry standard somewhere in the, the mid 60%. Um, but the top five chance, you know, what is this thing What's most likely of the top five would I think, well, that you get up into the uh, 85, 90%. And that's about where the industry is at. Well, now what if I want to take that network and I want to say, okay, I've learned all this stuff based on mobile net, but I have some new things I want to be able to classify. How am I going to do that? That's the incremental continuous learning. And we're going to show you one shot learning. This is done within our simulator, which simulates the hardware that we build. And basically we give one shot of a picture. It comes in as a, a particular image, and then we're able to classify that going forward based on the deep learning parameters that were learned previously. But we don't have to go through a deep learning cycle. That's the big difference. This happens in hardware in the matter of milliseconds at almost no power consumption. The coefficients necessary to do this classification are stored on the device. They don't go anywhere. So your data privacy is taken care of. You don't require any connectivity to do this learning, and you don't need any back propagation, compute heavy um, calculations in order to do this. It's very much the way that, that we would learn. So this is a demo that I'm going to show you. We've started with the mobile net. Um, V1 trained on the ImageNet database, and we basically have removed all of the classifiers. So at the beginning, there's nothing that this network can classify and tell you about. And we're going to teach it a few things. So first, we teach it what the background is, and then we're going to, we have our own little model zoo, which is a, a tiger. We've got a camel, an elephant, which will come up, and we're going to train it. These are all one-shot training, very quick police car, I think we get a fire truck in here. And you'll notice it's one shot at a particular angle and then an orange. And that was one shot. This, in deep learning, you would typically look at things hundreds or thousands of times in order to learn it. We, we took one shot and look at it and we say, what is it? Now, now we can find it again, even if we change the orientation, position, rotation, any of that, it's still going to be able to figure out what it is that we're looking at, even though it's different than what we trained on. This is the power of AI. Um, and so we'll see this for the fire truck, we'll see it for the police car. And, and you're going to notice as we go through this that you know, the network's not perfect. Neural networks work under the, the premise of voting as to the thing that something is most likely. And if it doesn't have enough information, it's going to do the best it can, like we would, if, we, if something is unclear, to guess what it is that we're looking at. And it's not always going to be right. Um, and we have the tiger. And we took one shot at this tiger, and we're going to move it around, and it should be able to flip it over and see what it is. So orientation, all of that doesn't matter. And you'd expect this from an AI system. This would be what you'd expect. You just wouldn't expect to be able to do this with one shot, learn it, and be done. Um, and that's the power of event domain. So we learned on those animals that were um, in cars that were no plastic models. Well, what happens if you now take and use a picture of those animals instead, how accurate is going to be? This is going to be rather challenging because it's quite a bit different than what we trained it on. You know, if you typically you would train something and you would show it, like I said, hundreds or thousands of different images, and then you would learn to be able to group all of those to a particular classifier. Here we learned on one thing, 
and said, okay, can you figure out based on that one, can you extend that out and extrapolate to something else? And it's not going to get it right every time because it's significantly different. So maybe you have to go back and have to do a bit more training, maybe one or another shot and add one, a bit more information in order to be more accurate. struggling a little bit with the elephant here. Sometimes it's an elephant, sometimes it's a camel. You know, the way neural networks work, they're looking both at features as well as colors and all the various abstractions of images in order to understand what we're looking at. The same way that we would. Um, so we'll go ahead and train a little bit more and then we're gonna see if we can do a better job. After we've learned, we've retrained it by adding more information about elephants based on the pictures, and now it's going to be much more accurate. So this time we had to do two shots. We had to show it the little animal plastic figurine as well as providing a picture for it to understand what it's looking at. And the same thing we can do with the tiger in order to get more accuracy there. We can add another picture like that and learn on that, and now you'll be able to see a much better accuracy on a wider range of tiger pictures and elements. So within 20 minutes here, I've, I've tried to give you guys some idea of where AI is going in the next generation. Um, the next generation, both for data centers as well as out to the edge in terms of bringing the power consumption way down and providing new mechanisms for learning that are much more efficient, much lower power, and much lower cost. And the edge AI market is an emerging market. It's just starting. So you can expect to start to see devices incorporating this type of technology um, over the next year or so. I think there's going to be a major transformation in the industry. And that's what I have for you today. Thank you. Great presentation, Roger. Uh, really cool stuff. I, I love seeing that video there, uh, a demo of exactly how this works. It helps me to visualize, uh, you know, what kind of cool cool uh, use cases uh, there are for the BrainShip solution. So uh, let's see, we do have some questions for you. While we do that, I'm going to just bring up this poll. Okay. People are voting so, as we go. Excellent, excellent. All right. So it's the poll almost as exciting as a presidential election here as we look through the poll. <laughs> That's right. So um, the question on the screen is, what additional information would you like about the brain chip solution? So we'll just leave that up while we do some Q&A. So first question that came in here they're asking is about um, how is the brain chip uh, Akita different from a GPU? Yeah, so that, that's fundamentally what we've done is evolved from the GPU. GPUs have been tremendous in terms of um, creating the ability and hardware to run AI workloads. But GPUs, when it comes right down to it, and, and deep learning accelerators, which are highly optimized versions of GPUs, are basically doing very high performance calculations, but are not providing any sort of uh, intelligence or real processing. There's a, a CPU somewhere and then software code that's running on top of that to do the processing. The BrainShift solution is a fully integrated neural processor. So it would be a coprocessor as opposed to an accelerator and it's standalone. Um, all of the you know, control is built into the device and it can run the workloads at extremely low power as well as providing the learning capability. So it is, it's really the next generation in AI solution from where the GPU and deep learning accelerators are today. Okay, okay, that's interesting. Um, another question they're asking is uh, about power requirements. I don't know if that's something that you have handy, handy um, but do you wanna answer that? Or do you wanna get back to that person about how much power the Akita chip consumes? So the Akita chip consumes power depending upon the workload it's running, which is going to be similar to any other hardware. 
Um, for I'll give a couple of examples. For keyword spotting, this would be the 30 Google words that are available out there. We're doing like 10 words per second at under 200 microwatts versus mobile net running 30 frames per second, being, having been trained on the ImageNet um, 1000 database. That's a little over 100 milliwatts to run that. Um, and this is all, when you get to hardware, you have to know what technology node you're at in order to put things in perspective. That's all, that's all benchmarked on a 28 nanometer solution. Um, we, for example, the mobile net, the, typically you'll see over a watt at the lowest power to do the same type of workload that we're doing a little over 100 milliwatts. Very nice, very nice. Um, another question they're asking, if such low power capabilities exist, why are organizations using other hardware? In essence, what are the limitations of BrainChip's hardware um, I'm not sure I understand that one, but I don't know if you want no, to take I that. Think I, I think I, I, I get the question, and it's, um, okay. it really gets kind of the heart, the heart of the issue. And it's, yeah, I don't know why anybody would use any other hardware. But that's, uh, <laughs> besides that, besides that comment, um, the, the hardware from Brainship is relatively new to the market. We've just recently introduced our IP and are engaged with a number of companies on integrating that into their chips, which will then show up in devices down the road once those chips become available. Our chip, our first hardware platform, will be available mid-year. So that's when you know, people will be able to start actually producing devices, end devices based on our technology. Right now we're working with a number of companies on developing their systems based on our technology. So the uptake is, is very strong. It's, there's a clear demand for edge devices with ultra low power and the ability to learn and personalize all the factors that are, are plaguing the edge. Um, so we're seeing tremendous interest. Okay, excellent, excellent. Uh, another question, uh, Nancy's asking, do you have any advice on how to decide which data should be handled with edge analytics? Wow, that's a... Uh, there's no good answer to that question. I think um, that comes down really to each system implementation and how they want to handle things. In the end, what we expect to see, and I think most people are converging on this, is that AI will become a distributed solution set. There will be some level of intelligence that's done at the very edge on the sensors. Then there'll be one step back, maybe at the base station, if you're connected wirelessly, there'll be a little bit more that's done there. And then there's going to be more done in the data center. So, and it's going to be different, for example, for an automotive use case versus, you know, somebody's cell phone camera use case versus a surveillance camera or a microphone somewhere. Every, each one of those is going to be different. Um, and it's really a case where the power constraints, the physical constraints, the cost constraints determine what's possible to be done. And then you do the most you can at the edge to minimize data flow. And then you leverage upstream resources as best as you possibly can. Okay. Okay. Good advice. Good advice for a tough question there. Um, another <laughs> question that came in, uh, why is incremental learning a challenge for traditional AI solutions? So incremental learning is challenged because the learning mechanisms today require something called back propagation. And back propagation is a, um, has a significant overhead, compute overhead, and requires quite a bit of data in order to process a variety of inputs that are all classified as the same. With our one-shot learning, you saw how we did the, the tiger and as an, a plastic animal as well as the picture. Well, imagine if you need 100 of those di completely different types of sources and then you're going to process them all and feed back into the network and change all of the parameters in the network to tune to that, it's actually going to affect all your other classifications as well. So the deep learning has a very hard time giving you a specific result for a specific input without impacting all of the other classifiers or results that you're looking for. The one-shot learning being a feed-forward process creates a new output based on everything it already knows and has no impact on the other outputs that are, or results or predictions that are coming from the network. 
That's the fundamental difference, as well as happening extremely fast on a very small amount of input. Okay, fascinating stuff. Uh, here's a question that came in from David. Is it possible to buy chips that are pre-trained? So the chips themselves um, aren't necessarily called pre-trained. The, the chips are loaded with a data set that comes from memory somewhere, which, all, which is all the parameters. It gets configured with those, and then it runs and does inference, or you could do continuous learning. So it would be a matter of buying uh, pre-trained network parameters to load onto the device, um, and we can certainly happy to work with customers to create those um, pre-trained models to utilize on our hardware. It's basically what our someone would use our Akita development environment to do. That's what data scientists do. Um, so that's the best way I can answer that question. Okay, so the training is in software, essentially. The, the training is a process of having um, data come in to a network and parameters get created. It is possible to do training on our device and have all the parameters created and held on the device based on a training set being flushed through the device. That's possible. You can do that, or you can do it in software and load the parameters in. You can do it either way. Interesting. Okay, cool. Uh, another question here. Uh, I'll struggle to say this. I'm sure you know what it means, though. <laughs> Does neuromorphic computing, uh, is that the same as a spiking neural network? Do you understand that one? I do understand that question, and it's a common question we get. Um, often we're, we're considered a spiking neural network company, and this is unfortunately uh, uh, something that comes with the idea that we're from a neuromorphic heritage. Neuromorphic computing is basically trying to use the brain, the human or animal brain, as a model for how to do computing for AI or for anything for that matter. That's neuromorphic computing. When you study the brain, you find out it's based on a spiking consoles, you know, spikes that are generated um, electrochemically in the brain and go between synapses and neurons. And then folks have developed uh, algorithms called spiking neural networks that try to emulate the way the brain works. So when we uh, have a heritage of being a neuromorphic compute company, but we've generalized that dramatically. We've now become, we have an event domain processor. It's, very, it's generic, it's capable of running and supporting many different types of neural networks, including spiking neural network, which is an algorithm, as well as convolutional neural networks um, and other types of neural networks that are out there. So there's a big difference between neuromorphic compute the spiking neural network um, algorithms and our processor, which is pretty generic and capable of supporting many different types of neural network algorithms. Very cool. Very cool. Another question here, what does event domain mean and how is it different from other solutions? Yeah, so event domain uh, versus data domain is, is um, as I tried to describe earlier in the, the presentation, event domain really only looks at pertinent information. That's the best way I can say, um, versus scanning everything. So in the needle in the haystack example, you know, event domain would take the input, which is all of this hay, and very quickly filter out the hay and throw it aside and not spend any time looking at it until it finds something shiny. In a neural network, what does that mean? As data's, input data is flowing through neural networks, which come in many layers, each layer is filtering things and providing input to the next layer. An event domain processor is going to filter at a particular layer and only neurons that will reach a high enough input activation, enough information that's important comes into them, they'll activate an event to propagate through to the next layer. If it doesn't have enough input energy, call it, it's not going to activate and it's not going to generate an event and nothing moves to the next layer from that neuron. So it self-filters the activity as you go through. And if you read, read through a lot of um, documentation about AI, you'll see the concept of sparsity. And sparsity in data is what we're talking about. There's also sparsity in weights and different types of sparsities. But here we're focusing on the sparsity in data. And that's fundamentally what an event domain processor can take advantage of. Very cool. Very cool. Well, Roger, it looks like that's all the questions we have. Uh, I guess one final question from me, and that is, I mean, if people are interested in what you're doing at BrainChip today, they want to learn more, uh, maybe they want to see this, the solution in action, what do you recommend that they do? 
So um, for folks on, on this call, I'd recommend going to doc.brainchipinc.com, which you can get to through our, our web, website if you search for Brainship. But doc.brainchipinc.com will take you to our Akita development environment where we have tremendous documentation and you can start playing with um, some of our example models and seeing how the whole thing works. Very cool. And in fact, I've placed that link there in the handouts tab for everyone. If you want to click on that, just uh, click on uh, the BrainChip URL and it'll take you to the BrainChip doc website where you can check it out and learn more. Uh, Roger, it's been great yeah. having you on the event today. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it.